Welcome to worship at Christ United Methodist Church. My name is Beth Graverholt, and I'm honored to serve as the associate pastor. At Christ UMC, we strive to be a welcoming and affirming community of faith. And that means whatever walk of life you're from, whatever your socioeconomic status, age, ethnicity, gender identity, or sexual orientation, we celebrate you and we welcome you because we believe all people are created in the image of God and loved by God for who they are. Before our worship service begins, I just want to take a moment to thank you for supporting the many ministries of our church. You, if you would like to continue supporting all of the things that we're doing uh, in the community, you can do so by giving online at our website or by mailing a check into our church office. Although you are worshiping with us online from your home, from the great outdoors, from your office or airports, I encourage you to make this a set apart time a time for you and God and the community to focus on things that are eternal, eternal truths that make an impact for us right here and now. So as we begin our worship this morning, would you please pray with me? Loving God, we know that you are at work in the world to bring justice to the oppressed, to share food with the hungry, to provide shelter for the homeless, to set all people free. We come today to be reminded of your justice, to be nourished by your presence, to find home with your people, to worship in joy and freedom. When we call, Lord, we know that you will answer, for your light breaks forth and your healing is in our midst. Help us to hear your voice as you whisper to us, here I am, amen. Our scripture today comes from the book of Matthew, chapter 5, verses 10 through 12. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven. For in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. As we continue our exploration of the Beatitudes and consider how God is at work among those who Jesus calls blessed in this passage of scripture, today it might be helpful to take a step back 
and explore what we mean when we say blessed and what Jesus probably meant when he said it. Religious historian Dr. Kate Bowler has studied how the term blessed became the most popular hashtag on social media and subsequently an American phenomenon. If you look around, you can see the word everywhere, from bumper stickers and license plates to t-shirts and tattoos. And based on Kate's research, what Americans really mean when we say we're hashtag blessed is that something unexpected happened, and it was good, and we a little bit deserved it. The underlying idea is that those who are blessed are just a little bit more worthy, faithful, or good, in charge of their own lives in ways that others aren't. When I drive around town and see hashtag blessed bumper stickers on the back of brand new $70,000 cars, what I'm led to think is that the driver believes that because of their character or hard work or intelligence, that God has gifted them with this particular overpriced piece of machinery. But in the Beatitudes, Jesus doesn't say, blessed are those who are wealthy or lucky. He said things like, blessed are those who mourn, those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, and blessed are those who are persecuted. As Kate explains, being blessed in the way Jesus meant is a lot more like love than luck. We are blessed when we can draw closer to the source of things that feed our souls. As we've been exploring the theme, heaven on earth, realizing the good life now, it's easy to think that what we might be talking about is the type of good life that looks like being really lucky and wealthy and happy in all the ways that modern society defines happiness. This definition of the good life that is defined by a material and physical richness has come to be known by scholars such as Kate as the prosperity gospel. The prosperity gospel treats faith like a formula for success, promising that if followers give to the church, for instance, that they will receive twice or five times as much money back in their own pockets. It promises that if you are just positive enough just pray hard enough or believe just the right thing that all the pain of this life will be relieved. Pastors of the prosperity gospel are held up as proof that the formula works when they fly across the country in their private jets, build multi-million dollar homes, or sport $5,000 sneakers while they preach. But this type of formula-based faith this material definition of the good life doesn't really square with what Jesus' descriptions in the Beatitudes say about who is blessed. Surely we've come to see this over the last few weeks as we've talked about how those who mourn are blessed, not because God promises to take the pain of loss away, but because God promises to be with us in the midst of it. We've seen how the poor in spirit are blessed, not because God makes them rich, but because they learn to rely on God in the midst of their own brokenness. We've seen how those who are merciful are blessed, even as they give away their own material resources for the sake of helping others. And today we reflect on Jesus' words, blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Persecution surely doesn't fall into anyone's description of the good life, as popular culture defines it. If we were to believe the prosperity gospel, then we would seek a life without resistance. But that's not what Jesus promised. As we learned last week, when Jesus used the word righteousness in the Greek, that's the same as saying justice. So Jesus says that those who are near to God, those who are blessed, are those who are suffering and targeted because of their commitment to God's justice. And when I think about Jesus' words in that way, the first person who comes to mind is one of the most famous Christians of the 20th century, 
Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. While we hold him up as a hero today, in his own era, Gallup polls in 1966 found that almost two-thirds of Americans had an unfavorable opinion of Dr. King. During his years as a civil rights leader, he was arrested multiple times, but was also physically attacked at speaking events, threatened over the phone, had crosses burned on his lawn, and even had his home bombed, with his wife and infant daughter inside. In his book, Stride Toward Freedom, King recalls a crisis of confidence after receiving a particularly threatening late night phone call on January 27, 1956, in the midst of the Montgomery bus boycotts. Exhausted and discouraged, he writes that he was ready to give up. And as he paced the floor at midnight, drinking a cup of coffee alone, he was trying to think of a way to move out of the picture without appearing a coward. And in the midst of his exhaustion, as it felt like all of his courage was gone, he writes that he decided to take his problem to God, to surrender all of his doubts, all of his pride, to let God be in charge. And at that moment, he says, I experienced the presence of the divine as I had never experienced it before. It seemed as though I could hear the quiet assurance of an inner voice saying, stand up for righteousness, stand up for truth, and God will be at your side forever. After that experience, King says, he was ready to face anything. And he did for another 12 years, right up until he was assassinated in 1968. And I look at King's life, his legacy, as a person deeply committed to God's justice. And while I grieve the fact that his life was taken before he could accomplish all that he had hoped, I look at the life of Christ, the savior he followed. And I question how King's life could have ended any differently. Because the way of Jesus leads to the cross. And while dying at the hands of those who oppose you, truly the ultimate persecution, well, that wouldn't make anyone feel hashtag blessed. Jesus said that the kingdom of heaven, the good life that God envisions, belongs to those who are persecuted for the sake of God's justice. As Pastor Chris Seedman writes, living in the light of the realities Jesus articulates in the previous seven Beatitudes, will most surely guarantee personal experience with the eighth Beatitude. In this church, we believe that we are called to live as disciples who embody these Beatitudes. Disciples who act inclusively, serve others, do justice, and seek God. And as we follow that path, we are sure to encounter resistance. Resistance that may jeopardize our material comforts, our friendships, and business as usual. And when we experience hardship, the world will tell us that we're doing something wrong. Just as the world made Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. question his calling. The world will tell us that the good life could be ours if we would just fall in line or be normal or uncontroversial if we would just stop pursuing this justice thing, if we would just look out for ourselves. And such sentiments are likely to come from others who consider themselves Christians, unfortunately. In this beatitude, Jesus reminds his listeners specifically of the resistance that the prophets faced, resistance which did come from other religious people. And as we work for God's justice, it's likely that we too will experience resistance from those who claim the same faith as we do. This is not cause to give up. And while it may seem counterintuitive to those who believe the good life is about fortune and fame, Jesus tells us that this resistance is a sign that we are blessed, a sign that we are experiencing the good life right here and now as we partner with our Creator to build the kingdom of God on earth as it is in heaven.
Amen. Would you please join me in prayer? Loving God, when we are tempted by the health, wealth, and prosperity that the world offers, when we allow these things to separate us from you and from our calling to do justice, love mercy, and walk humbly by your side, deliver us. Help us to pursue the lives of discipleship which Jesus has called us to. Lives that may not always be easy or comfortable by the world standards, but which draws closer to you, 
the source of all life and goodness. Help us to always be ready to extend a hand of mercy to those who are suffering and to lift our voices for the sake of your justice, which seeks to heal and restore all that is broken in our world. And Lord, we also recognize that in this community, even if we experience resistance as we seek to live as your disciples, we will likely never face religious persecution at the level which so many Christians around the world do. The 309 million Christians who the World Watch List reports experience high levels of persecution and discrimination because of their choice to worship publicly and follow Christ. Today, we lift up all those who are truly in danger because of their faith, in danger of being kidnapped, imprisoned, or killed, separated from their communities and families. We pray that your hand of protection would be upon them and that you would give them courage and strength. Lord, we pray for a world in which all people will live peaceably, where all have the opportunity to flourish but we know that that world cannot be built on its own. That while you created all things and called them good, you also commissioned us to be your co-laborers in caring for all of creation, the earth, air, and water of our world that sits polluted, the animals who are irresponsibly hunted and whose habitats are disappearing, the people who suffer from injustice, illness, and conflict. God, we pray that you would make us your hands and feet to go from here into the world, to partner with you and with others, to heal all that has been broken, to restore all that has been lost. We ask this in the name of your son, Jesus, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
May you go forth knowing who and whose you are. You are a child of God and a person of worth, called to live as a disciple of Jesus Christ, who acts inclusively, serves others, works for justice, and seeks God. May you go in peace. Amen. <laughs>